And it's through the imagination that we recognize our self sameness with the creator. And it's through the imagination that we access these sympathies and understand these sympathies between the heavens and the earth and between mm. God and ourselves and the gods and ourselves. And it's through the imagination that we can connect with the planets and the work mm. of the seven spheres and these mythological, psychological archetypes within us. Mm. And the more we can hone and develop the imagination, the better we're able to do this, the better we're able to access these higher states of mind. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I'm joined by Marlene Seven Bremner, author of Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy. Seven discusses the importance of imagination in the imaginal realm, similarities between Hermeticism and yoga, Hermetic texts, including the Corpus Hermeticum and the Enroll Tablet, Hermetic cosmology, astrology, the journey through the seven spheres and working with archetypal planetary powers. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Marlena Seven Bremner is a self-taught oil painter, writer, and teacher who has spent more than 20 years exploring esoteric and spiritual traditions, including Hermeticism, alchemy, surrealism, symbolism, tarot, psychology, magic, astrology, shamanism, and mythology. She developed her career as an artist in the Pacific Northwest and now spends her time painting and writing in the New Mexico desert. She joins me today to discuss her book, Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, The Emerald Tablet, The Corpus Hermeticum, and The Journey Through the Seven Spheres. Seven, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And my understanding is this is your first book. Is that correct? It is. Okay. Well, congratulations on it. It was a really good read. It was a fun read. I've read a few books on hermetic philosophy and hermeticism, and I found what you did to be very clear, I think, and very accessible to people. And so I'm really looking forward to speaking with you about this. And I thought that maybe the best place to begin is for anyone who may not know what is hermeticism? What is hermetic philosophy? Well, that's a big question, Nick. There are a lot of things <laughs> that hermeticism has come to encompass over the centuries. But what I really wanted to get at in the book was the original texts that can be described as hermetic. Mm -hmm. And they're, they are of Greco-Egyptian origin, written in the first few centuries of the Common Era. And they involve dialogues between usually a student or a disciple and Hermes. So Hermes is sort of the patron deity of the Hermetic tradition. And he goes by Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest. And this was a sort of syncretic form of the Greek Hermes and the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. So these Hermetic teachings, while they were written mostly by, by Greek philosophers, these teachings were transmitted from ancient Egypt. And so there's a lot of overlap between the Hermetica and ancient Egyptian cosmogony and cosmology and mythology. And so you see like various figures within the Hermetic texts like Isis or references to Amun or descriptions of God as a craftsman, which sort of references the Egyptian deity Ptah. So I really wanted to get at that element of the Hermetica in the book. And that's my approach to hermeticism is through these philosophical, mystical texts. Hmm. Yeah, there's a really rich tradition that I think it's really interesting to kind of tap into because it seems to have been kind of lost in a way to us in some aspects. And I like it. I personally like it because it seems like it fills in a missing gap in Western spirituality and philosophy. So let me ask you, what was it that initially interested you in hermetic philosophy and hermeticism? Well, my first introduction to it was through my 
um, studies of polarity therapy. I, I trained in polarity therapy for five years. Can you say what that is? What's polarity yeah. therapy? It's a hands-on healing modality that works with the positive, neutral, and negative poles of the body. So a person's energy field and using both hands on the body to open up blockages within that field. And so it incorporates work with the chakras, work with the auric bodies, but also like very deep tissue work and manipulations. And it's a really beautiful holistic system. And many of it, much of it is based in Ayurveda. Some of it is based in osteopathy, but a big part of it is based in hermetic teachings mm -hmm. and especially revolving around the caduceus of Hermes, the staff of Hermes, and the way that energy spirals up the spinal column. And so that was my first real introduction to hermetics. And, you know, I read the Kabbalion and mm. became kind of curious about it. And as the years went on, I, I studied alchemy and came to an understanding of alchemy and related that to my creative process and just wanted to understand where all of this came from and what it was mm. rooted in. And that's what really led me into my study of these hermetic texts. Okay. And so the hermetic text, you mentioned the Kabillion. I, I never know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And so I just kind of, let's unpack these a little bit because yeah. there's a couple of different sources and maybe you can talk about the different sources of hermetic text for us. Yeah. Yeah. So the Corpus Hermeticum is the main body of hermetic texts. And that's a series of 17 treatises. And like I said, those are written as dialogues, usually between Hermes and a disciple, or sometimes between mind and Hermes. Mm -hmm. And they discuss hermetic cosmogony, the vision of creation, what it means to live a pious and virtuous life, what it means to be human and the hum human's relationship to God and to the cosmos. It describes the cosmos as a series of seven spheres and spheres beyond that. And those relate to the seven traditional planets. So these texts describe the way that we can overcome these sort of forces of fate that these seven planets represent and ascend to a higher level of being and ultimately become one with God. And this is something that we can do at death, but it's also something that we can do during life. So there's a very spiritual emphasis in the Corpus Hermeticum. And that's, like I said, one of the main texts of mm -hmm. the Hermetica. And then there's other fragments and excerpts, like the excerpts of Stobius and the Asclepius and uh, let's see, the Discourse of the Eighth and Ninth, which was a more recently discovered text written in Coptic that was mm -hmm. part of the Gnostic Gospels mm -hmm. discovered at Nag Hammadi. And then, of course, there's the Emerald Tablet of Thoth. And that's just a, a short, short document that mm -hmm. is a vision of creation and the relation of the above and below. And it's where that famous hermetic axiom as above, so below comes from. And that one is really referenced quite a bit in the alchemical tradition. And yeah, those are the main ones that are coming to mind at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ones that I, I, I'm aware of. And I think also the Greek magical papyri, yeah. aren't those also kind of connected to hermeticism as well? They are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of references to Hermes and essentially anything that is written in reverence to Hermes or attributed to Hermes that can be considered hermetic. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of hermetic texts that are considered more technical and mm. those relate more to alchemy and magic and astrology, whereas the traditional philosophical and theological texts are considered the like the true hermetica. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, and then the Kabyle... I can never say this. Uh, a <laughs> billion is much later, right? Isn't that a product of, I think, like the 20th century even? It is. Yeah. Early 20th century. Yeah. 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 And I love the Kabbalion. I think it's great. It's much less theological in its orientation. Mm. Right. And I think it's very accessible. And I think it's a great entry point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I definitely encourage people to go beyond that and to, yeah, to read yeah. these original texts. Yeah, yeah, I would too. I think the original texts are quite amazing. And it's very syncretic. You know, we've already discussed this, that it has its roots in Egypt, but there are clearly also, it seems to be kind of influences from 
the Pythagorean tradition and also Platonism. And I guess there may even be suggestions that both the Pythagoreans and Platonists actually were influenced from the Egyptian thinkers originally. And so it's probably, I don't know, maybe a weird thing where you had the Egyptian thought influencing them and then the Pythagorean and Platonic thought then kind of transiting or transforming to become or influence hermetic thought. Would you agree with that? Is that kind of the trajectory? Yeah. And I think that's pretty much how I describe it in the book. Like Pythagoras was said to have spent 22 years in Egypt Mm -hmm. studying and learning and being initiated with the priests there and then bringing that wisdom back to Greece. Mm -hmm. Plato as well was said to have traveled to Egypt and so many of the philosophers and Yeah, I think that was a huge influence on their philosophies. And then in turn, like that leading into Neoplatonism, and you see a lot of that in the Hermetica. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so with Hermes Trismegistus, there's connections with the the Greek god Thoth and then the Greek god Hermes. Mm -hmm. Is Hermes Trismegistus, though, is, is he seen as divine? or human or a little bit of both? How would you describe Hermes? A little bit of both. It depends okay. on who's, uh, whose perspective you're coming from. Okay. But yeah, a little bit of both. I see him as divine, as something that's okay. been with humanity for all okay. time, from the beginning. Right. You know, okay. an aspect or a, a transmitter of divine mind. Okay. But right. a lot of people did see Hermes as a living figure at some point in the past, maybe contemporary with Moses or even predating Moses. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's been mostly abandoned. I think mostly abandoned. So you've talked a little bit about or mentioned the cosmogony. And I was wondering if you could say something about that. What is the hermetic cosmogony? Well, essentially everything begins in this darkness right this watery darkness and in alchemy this is considered the the prima materia you know it's undifferentiated consciousness and everything exists within it but it's pure potentiality nothing is formed yet there's no differentiation between anything Hmm. and from within this the elements emerge and they separate and that's where we get the polarities so these Hmm. forces of positive and negative attraction and repulsion and these are interwoven throughout all of creation. And the divine creator from whom all of this is emerging, seeking to know himself, he creates a second mind, which is considered noose or like the divine mind. And from there, humanity is created and the seven planets, which are the governors of fate Mm. and all of the animals and everything on the earth and throughout the cosmos. So would you say that mind then is foundational? I would, yeah. Okay. And so if I understand, I'm going to try to repeat what you just said, just to make sure I'm clear on it, that there is this sort of universal mind. And one of the things that came to my mind when you were talking is that this is actually something that you do find in a lot of ancient myths. And it's also even in the book of Genesis, it's in Genesis one, where in the beginning there was chaos, but chaos is often represented as water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's what we see in Genesis one, you have God, you know, the spirit of God hovering over the face of the water. And this is before God's created anything. So there is that pure, you know, that, 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 that watery chaos, and the understanding of chaos, and I think this is what you said, it, it is a kind of potentiality, mm-hmm. that it's pure potential, not chaos as we think, you know, in more modern terms, but pure potential. And so you've got this pure potential, and then you've got this sort of mind of God, and then noose, which is a secondary mind. Yeah, is that sort correct? Of- the demiurge yeah okay and it's through this the the and the demiurge is a very kind of gnostic and platonic way of talking but it is a creator and artisan god that then yeah. fashions everything but then but everything exists within mind yes everything exists within mind 
and mind connects us with God. Okay. God is pervasive throughout the cosmos. God is within everything and everything is within God. But mind is sort of this etheric aspect Mm -hmm. that connects us with that divine element. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's also interesting, you know, not just in sort of Western myths, but I also see connections and you bring some of these out in the book with especially yoga philosophy in India. And I think at one point, I'm trying to see if I can find it in my notes where you make a connection with Indian yoga. Yeah. With alchemy, you said that alchemy is comparable to Indian yoga. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask you was how, because I think this is a different understanding of yoga than again, what most people have, you know, I think when you talk about Indian yoga, you're not talking about just getting bendy, that there's more to it than that. Yes. Yes. Well, there's asanas in yoga, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the different positions that you take. Yeah. Yeah. But this is more about internal alchemy. And so you see a correspondence between the caduceus of the Indian yogis, the staff of Hermes, which in in the Indian system, it's the two serpents spiraling up the spinal column. Mm -hmm. And those are Ida and Pingala. So you've got this feminine and masculine energy. And the whole purpose of yoga, which means union is to, or Hatha yoga, the union of the sun and the moon. It's the union of these masculine and feminine energies within us. And through that, the kundalini energy rises up the spine and reaches the crown. And that's enlightenment, Mm. essentially. Mm. And so the staff of Hermes is also, it goes back to ancient Egypt. Mm. And so there's that crossover. Mm. But the alchemy comes in with that union of the male and the female. And that's such a pivotal point in the alchemical work is which is in that system, it's considered mercury and sulfur. Mm -hmm. So feminine and masculine principles and their union produces the philosopher's stone, which is Mm -hmm. again, that enlightenment, that true gnosis and self-knowledge. Right. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the comparisons and the similarities are quite striking. I think when you stop and look at them, you know, because, you know, that seems to me is, how we describe hermeticism that it is this practice of sorts i don't think there's anything like the asanas in hermeticism is there Um, no no yeah yeah yeah, but they do you know in the corpus hermeticum in the first book there's a passage about de-energizing the seven spheres Mm -hmm. and so if we think about that in terms of the seven chakras these energy points that go up and down the spine okay that's a similar way of looking at it. And de-energizing would be, you've got these two positive and negative energies that are, you know, constantly at odds with each other or or swinging from one pole to the other, that sort of thing. When we can unify those energies, then we're aligned, we can become aligned with our our higher divine will and become much more effective in our our magic and in our essential being. Right. And so the the goal of, hermeticism then is to have that gnosis that mystical realization that we are one with god that we're and that our mind is god's mind exactly is that fair okay yeah yeah and so and that that's actually another area where i see a connection with the yoga because my understanding in yoga philosophy it is to understand or have a kind of gnosis that you are pure consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. There are so many similarities and I would really love to research that. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some people yeah. attribute that to being due to like an even more ancient race yeah. or a more ancient series of teachings that, you know, were common to both Egyptian and Indian and Babylonian yeah. roots. Yeah. And I think that's really fascinating to think about. Yeah, there's a book. I, I have it. I've never read it. And I think it's called The Alchemical Body. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's all about the Indian alchemical tradition. And I think it makes connections to yoga. But again, I've, I've not read it. I know that one of my professors said that it's a very difficult book to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think the author is David Gordon White, although I'm not oh. positive on that. But I know the title is The Alchemical Body. 
Okay. Yeah. I'll check um, that. You've mentioned alchemy. So, and I'm going to hit you up on this, <laughs> the, the, can, you know, what is alchemy and what's, what specifically are the kind of the connections between alchemy and hermeticism? Mm. Well, alchemy, the word itself is an Arabic word. And it means it comes from alchemy, which means the black land. And that refers to the black lands of ancient Egypt, the rich fertile soil around the Nile. And so it's seen as being rooted in Egypt, just like the hermetic teachings. And you don't see a lot of references to alchemy throughout the traditional hermetica, but there are a lot of alchemical texts written over the centuries, going back to Hellenistic times and before and after that refer to Hermes mm. and are written and reverenced to Hermes and, or sometimes as Mercurius, the Roman version. Mm. And yeah, what we see, what's interesting to me is in alchemy, the importance of the seven metals mm. and those are associated with the seven planetary bodies. And so there's a sort of correspondence between their earthly counterparts in the form of the metals and their celestial counterparts in the form of the planets. And those seven planets are also very important in the Hermetica. And I see that as being one of the main links between the traditional Hermetica and alchemy and the work of purifying these metals and bringing them to their most ennobled, exalted state in the form of gold and silver. That mirrors this work of de-energizing the spheres and rising up through the spheres and reaching a, a higher level of being. Mm. And Whereas in alchemy, it's about, you know, realizing that philosopher's stone within yourself, or if you're working in a laboratory, creating the philosopher's stone. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, alchemy, I find endlessly fascinating. And it's actually kind of studying alchemy is what led me to reading up on hermeticism. And a lot of my background was in Jungian psychology. And Jung, of course, wrote a couple of books, uh, three major works on on alchemy. And so that philosopher's stone is the great self. And so it mirrors that hermetic transformation or gnosis. Is that right? That yeah. once you find the, her, the, the philosopher's stone, that is equal to. Yes. So I, I, I wanted to ask you about the astrology, because I think that you noted that there are three primary branches mm -hmm. in hermeticism. And so there's magic or theurgy, astrology and alchemy. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll come back to the magic, but the last part of your book is about that journey through the seven spheres. And I found it really interesting. And I don't have, it's unfortunate. I don't, I didn't take a lot of notes in that part because I was like, wow, because so much of it seemed to be grounded in a sort of comparative mythology because mm -hmm. uh, you're drawing from all these different things, but you're looking at the seven traditional planets, mm -hmm. the sun and the moon were considered traditional planets in this astrological system, but it didn't seem to be like what I think anyone who, the, the expectation of what writings on astrology would be like, because you're not talking about like houses and aspects and things like that. And so I wanted to ask you about that relationship between hermeticism and astrology and how the planets can be worked with, uh, how those seven spheres are worked with. And I know that's a big question. <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it is. And I spent yeah many pages in the book going into right. that. But my favorite way to think about it is to relate it to the chakras. And to think about these seven planets or seven spheres, as they're called in the Hermetica, as existing within us. Mm. But they are bodies outside in the cosmos, but they're also within us. And so the movements of the planets through the heavens have an effect on us. And in particular, the arrangement of those planets at the time of birth, the natal chart. Mm. And so if we're existing in a sort of unconscious way throughout our lives, we're just being driven by the forces of these planets. And that's what we call fate. And in the Hermetica, it's called the harmony. 
-hmm. And the whole point of ascending through these spheres is to overcome this harmony and become mm -hmm. agents of our own fate. Mm -hmm. And if we look at them in terms of the, the chakras, it's, it all starts with Saturn, which is the root chakra. Mm -hmm. And that relates to these Saturnian elements of contraction and fear, but also just physical survival and like the basic mm -hmm. elements of being in a body and the limitations that come with that and responsibilities and these heavy, dense energies of matter that we have to deal with in human form. And as we move up the next chakra, which is in the low belly, it's called the sacral chakra that relates to Jupiter. And so as we're moving up through the chakras, we're also moving inward from the planets, Saturn being the outermost of these seven traditional planets and Jupiter the next as we move inward. And that relates to water and aspects of expansion, but also relationships and emotions and creativity and sexuality and Jupiterian sort of compulsions and tendency to excess and lust and gluttony and those sorts of vices. And so with each of these planets or spheres, there are different vices that come along with them and things that we have to deal with on a personal level. And it's very unique to each of us. And a lot of that is sort of laid out in our birth chart. And we can kind of use that as a map to understand how to work with these planets. Um, okay. So yeah, moving up, then it goes to Mars at the solar plexus and Venus at the heart, Mercury at the throat, and then the moon at the third eye and the sun at the crown. And the union of those two is like really, really important for self-realization. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. I think so. I guess that what I'm trying to understand is how to work with the planet so and how to work with these energies and so correct me if i'm wrong but if you've got your natal chart and let's say that your saturn's in a bad position <laughs> or a challenging position we'll say a challenging position yeah. then if i understand correctly what you can do is work with that sort of archetypal energy mm -hmm. so that you don't have to spend your entire life at the mercy of that bad Saturn placement, that you can actually find a kind of release from it. And that the natal chart is telling you, this is where you can actually focus on to improve your lot in life. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. And I think in one sense, it's very important just to become familiar with these energies and mm -hmm. how they're working through us to become conscious of them mm -hmm. rather than just letting them, like you're saying, right. just like have dominion over us. Right. So forming a relationship with the planets, I think is really foundational. Mm -hmm. And one way that we can do that is to have a, a daily planetary practice. Mm -hmm. So each day of the week corresponds with a different planet. So Saturn would be Saturday. And so you could do some work in, reverence to Saturn, you could wear black and like, mm. you know, get into different ways of creating around Saturn, invoke Saturn with different hymns and things like that. So yeah. that's one way to work with the planets and to sort of balance out these energies is to just form a relationship with them. And, but also to look at, you know, what is our Saturn work? What is our shadow work that we're dealing with mm. right now? Yeah. What are these aspects of ourselves that we don't want to look at? Where do we get stuck? Where do we feel inertia? Where do we feel limited? And right. to, you know, just go on a journey of self-investigation and looking at it through the lens of these archetypes is a really helpful way to do that because these are just very foundational energies that we all deal with. Right. And with the chakras and the, the planet, and I'm not that familiar with them. Mm -hmm. uh, are those the traditional placements in the, the planets and the chakras from India, or is that something that you kind of developed? Well, this is sort of how it's related in alchemy. Mm -hmm. I think the Indian tradition, in some cases it matches up, but I think sometimes it's slightly different. Okay. All like right. I think the uh, moon is corresponding with the one that's assigned to Jupiter in the alchemical okay. tradition. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Because I know that India has their in whole entire astrological system that's mm -hmm. similar in some ways. And it seems to me that the astrological system that corresponds to all of this the best would be hellenic astrology yeah that yeah. we're actually 
really starting to, it seems to have a resurgence at the moment, um, mm-hmm. thanks to Chris Brennan and yeah. uh, a few other people. Yeah, um, I love his work. Oh yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, and I was actually, I, I have to admit, I was listening, he, I forget who he was speaking with, but uh, on the astrology podcast that he hosts, he was speaking to someone about hermeticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had listened to the first part of that. And then last night I went for a walk and listened to the, the last part of it. And I thought it would be good in sort of preparation. And whoever his guest was, and I forget who it was, had mentioned in the Greek magical papyri that there was a section on there. It was a like a petition to the planets to be released from your fate, uh, Mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting. And it took me to what your work is doing and how you were thinking about the planets is that, you know, we're not trapped by that natal chart that we can actually find release from it. Yeah. 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 And I think the Greek magical papyri, that's like a very magical way of doing that work. Yeah. 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 So since we're talking about magic, let's talk about magic. What is, what is magic from a hermetic perspective? Mm. Well, looking at the corpus hermetic, there's a few references and in particular in the Asclepius, Mm. and this goes back to the Egyptian magic of ensouling a statue. So like calling down the divine powers through correspondence, through sympathy to inhabit Mm. a physical form, to inhabit a statue. And that's done through invocations and incense and plants and minerals and things that are brought together to call down the spirit of a certain God to inhabit a statue. And I just had the blessing of traveling in Egypt. And you can really feel that in certain places, that Mm. sort of divine presence. And you really feel like there is a soul within Mm. some of these statues or reliefs. And that's the whole idea is that you are working with sympathy. So these correspondences between the above and the below and that everything in the celestial sphere has a mirror down below here on earth. And that through understanding how these things connect and how they relate to each other, we can invite the gods to to work with us in a magical way. And so if we wanna work with a certain deity, we can do this in our own magical practice Mm. and gather together different things that we think that they'll like and like speak to them in a way that they'll like and invoke them with beautiful poetry and hymns and invite them to come and help us. And in a way that's, that's us calling on this aspect of ourselves to, Hmm. to come through so that we can embody it. And I think that's a really beautiful way to look at the magic of hermeticism, but there's so many different elements that have developed over the centuries, you know, and like, Kabbalistic Mm. magic and the magic of the golden dawn and and these very elaborate systems that are rooted in hermetic philosophy and mysticism, Mm. but that are kind of a world all their own. Right. Yeah, they are. (laughs) Yeah. Kabbalah is incredibly detailed and I know a little bit about the golden dawn, but, and I, and I know all of this is also, and this is another one of your interests is found in Mm -hmm. some Tarot decks a little bit more than others, but you also kind of want to stick with magic here for a moment. You also write that magic refers to a mental state. Mm -hmm. So is the sort of the rituals that you described and, you know, the offering of the incense and the working with an image and the invocations, you know, I like to read the Orphic hymns yeah. uh, when I do this. I think those are perfect for it. Mm-hmm. Is all of that then to create a very specific mental state that you can then work with? Yes. That's how I think of it. Okay. Yeah. I I see it all as existing within us, all of these deities. They're a part of us and they're also outside of us. They're bigger Mm -hmm. than us, Mm -hmm. but we are connecting with their energies. And so we can look at it as a sort of vibrational state, which affects Mm -hmm. our mind. And through all of these invocations and rituals and really like focusing on a certain archetype and energy, we become that. It inhabits Mm -hmm. our sphere. We're inviting that into our, personal energy field and yeah it is like a state of mind and ultimately I think all magic is really honing our ability to focus and still the mind Mm. and to come to a place of clarity and 
align our will, our personal will with the divine will. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can do magic for all kinds of things um, right. for personal gain and whatnot and to change our lot and to, to feel better about things in our, our life and our reality. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think that's where it leads us is to this place where we're unified with the creator of all things. Mm -hmm. And then there's this sort of magical creation that's taking place all the time because our mind is so focused and still right. and aligned with its will. Mm. Yeah. Is there meditational aspects to hermeticism? Well, there is often you see in the Corpus Hermeticum passages about the importance of stillness mm. and silence Okay. and disengaging the senses of the body. So I think you could definitely interpret that as a meditation. I also interpret it as a way of entering the imaginal realm okay. and disconnecting from the world of the senses and connecting with that more eternal, expansive, unlimited part of ourselves. And the only way to really do that is to reach a place of complete stillness and hmm. internal focus. So you could definitely interpret that as a form of meditation. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah. also the emphasis on prayer, I think, could be interpreted yeah. that way. Sure, sure. Well, prayer is sometimes referred to as a kind of meditation, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think it takes us back to traditional yoga, which, mm -hmm. you know, we're told, you know, yoga is about stilling the turbulences of the mind, right? And you need to do that in order to affect any kind of change. And the change here, it's not just change in the world, but it's also self-change, mm -hmm. right? It just takes us back to that transformation of self and attempt to achieve gnosis, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Everything that's happening in the outer world is reflected within. Right. So in alchemy too, you know, if you're working in a laboratory, these processes that you're watching unfold within your vessel are also happening within you. And so that's where the, right. where the magic is. Right. And we can do the same thing in a creative practice where like our work is our laboratory and our right. body is the vessel. And so we see these sort of mirrored processes unfolding within and without. Right, right. Yeah. And you included some of your artwork in the book. And I, I found the artwork to be quite stunning. And I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. there will be more. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. But let's talk just a little bit about the importance of imagination, because you'd mentioned the imaginal realm. And you say that imagination, you, you wrote this, that imagination is integral to each of the branches of hermeticism. Mm -hmm. So how? Say some things about the imagination, because I think that we have a tendency to downplay imagination in our world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's really a product of the enlightenment and the sort of mm -hmm. rationality that has taken mm -hmm. over and imagination has been cast into the, the dung heap, you know? Yeah. But I do believe that it's very integral to all the branches of Hermeticism, astrology, alchemy, and magic, and just integral in general to living a more holistic and complete life and beautiful life. But if you think about it, the image making powers of God, that's how everything has come to be. And so in essence, we are an image of God. We are in the imagination of God. And it's through the imagination that we recognize our self sameness with the creator. And it's through the imagination that we access these sympathies and understand these sympathies between the heavens and the earth and mm. between God and ourselves and the gods and ourselves. And it's through the imagination that we can connect with the planets and the work of the seven spheres and these mythological, psychological archetypes within us. Mm. And the more we can hone and develop the imagination, the better we're able to do this, the better we're able to access these higher states of mind mm. and reach that sort of unlimited creative potential within us. Right. Yeah. And uh, Jung did this with, I think he called it active imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's a sort of, I see it as a sort of blend of the conscious and the unconscious because mm. oftentimes active Im imagination is done with say like a dream mm. that feels incomplete and you want to go back into the dream and kind of mm see what it has to teach you, but you're doing it in a conscious way. So you're doing it 
in your waking state, mm -hmm. but stilling the mind and going into this place of active imagination where you're like both conscious and unconscious at the same time, which I think right. is really interesting. Yeah. Or you could do it, you could, you know, just go into a sort of receptive state and see what arises, some sort of unconscious figure that wants to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. And then you start a dialogue back and forth where you're asking questions or they're speaking to you and teaching you. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do it is to keep it pretty short and mm -hmm. to write it down as you go along so right. that you have a record for what transpired. So mm -hmm. yeah, active imagination is really fun and interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I don't, I don't know if I've ever actually tried, I guess maybe I've tried it mostly in attempted, I guess I would refer to it as like trance states, trying mm -hmm. to reach that kind of hypnagogic moment where mm -hmm. I'm not quite awake, not quite asleep uh, mm -hmm. and see what arises then, but it's very difficult to maintain it and i guess that's why you're like keep it short <laughs> yeah keep keeping it short. it short is helpful yeah, yeah but i like yeah. that you mentioned that similarity to trance states and the hypnagogic mm. state which is right when we're like on the brink of sleep mm. but our lucid visioning capacities are really awake mm. so we're very relaxed in the body the senses are subdued but our mind is awake and we're able to to see things in that hypnagogic state or for some people it's more auditory or mm. sensory not everybody you know, works with a visionary kind of right. um, realm with the imagination. It can be a felt sense or it can be auditory as well and mm -hmm. in other ways. But yeah, I think that as we're slipping into the unconscious, it's such a beautiful time to plant seeds in the unconscious mm -hmm. and yeah. go into the imagination and imagine things in their ideal state the way that we want them to be. So if we have something that we want to change about ourselves or in our lives, a circumstance, that's a really great time to go in yeah. and do that and just imagine it unfolding it right. in the moment as though it's really happening and allowing yourself to feel all those emotions of joy and gratitude and all of that and just let that bring you into sleep hmm. yeah yeah that reminds me a lot and this is kind of off topic i think but it reminds me of what is referred to as new thought like, you know, based on like Neville Goddard and uh, Mitch Horowitz has been writing a lot about that. And I know that that's something that is often suggested is to kind of, like you said, plant those seeds as you're falling asleep in the imagination yeah. Yeah. to make it manifest somehow. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Neville Goddard. Yeah. 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 I think he just has such a beautiful way of describing that process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of what he teaches is very rooted in hermetic teaching yeah. as well so i think that's beautiful yeah and, yeah yeah well and he based everything on kind of an interpretation of the biblical text but the way he describes it is very much like what you were saying is that mm -hmm. you know we are creators as well mm -hmm. right? and the imagination is that realm of creation do you know if he was familiar with any of the hermetic texts at all or influenced by them at all you know, I, I feel like I recently came across something that would make me say yes, but I couldn't tell you exactly what that was at the moment. Mm. Um, okay. But yeah, he definitely interpreted scripture right. in that way that God is our own wonderful human imagination. Yeah, yeah. And But I do think there are hermetic influences and I wish I could answer that more. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, and I know it wasn't part of the book, but that's where the conversation was going. So I just thought yeah. I would ask. Yeah. One of the things I like, about all of this, and this is my own personal, I guess, background, is especially when you were talking about the planetary influences, that they all have sort of their virtues and vices. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is important because as a spiritual tradition, Hermeticism has a morality Mm -hmm. grounded in these ideas of virtue and vice. Mm -hmm. And I really like that there's this question of the, and this goes back to Plato of, it's called the unity of the virtues or all the virtues one. You know, if you have one virtue, do you have all the virtues? And mm -hmm. it seems like from what you wrote, the answer to that is yes that there really is one vice and that vice is ignorance. Mm -hmm. And then there's one virtue, which is knowledge of God. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. There's vices and virtues associated with the seven planets, but mm. then there's also these 12 tormentors. Mm. And so basically 12 vices. Oh. And you could relate those to the 12 signs of the zodiac, but the Hermetica doesn't really define how those relate and like which mm. sign corresponds with which vice. And then there are 10 virtues. So mm. there's fewer virtues than there are vices. <laughs> But yeah, once that makes you, sense. <laughs> the most important of which is knowledge of God. Right. And through that, we can overcome all of the vices. But especially when you have the 10 virtues, then hmm. the good, the life, and the light, these aspects of God are with us. And all of the vices fly away and a flapping of wings is how it's described. Oh, oh that's yeah. beautiful. I like that. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And I think it's important because so many people think in terms of, spirituality in sort of moral and ethical terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the appeal to the traditional religions is that there is kind of a moral basis, sometimes problematic. And I think that in what I would refer to as sort of new age thought, it often seems to be missing. You know, mm -hmm. there seems to be... Uh, very little in the way of thinking in terms of morality. And this is when I read about virtues and vices, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what, you know, morality right there. This is an ethical system too. And that it's every bit as important on that spiritual path. Well, yeah. 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 I think it's very important. And, and that's the work of de-energizing the spheres. Mm. It's like clearing out these vices that we're compelled to. Yeah through those planetary energies. Yeah. So that would be part of the practice then of hermeticism, I would say. I would say so. Yeah. Okay. And it's unique to each and every one of us. You know, I think looking at those 12 tormentors, that's sort of just a guideline, mm. but we all know what our own vices are. And sometimes <laughs> <laughs> what's a vice for one person might actually be a virtue for another. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't well, think it's cut yeah. and dry. Yeah. When I was also thinking that sometimes our vices were a little unconscious of them um, mm -hmm. and that this also helps us and it kind of gets back to Jung is that, you know, part of the journey here is to make what is unconscious conscious, you know, because yeah. we have, you know, and that's part of the, the great work, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Sometimes we are not conscious of our vices. <laughs> that's a right. good point. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and it's not just the vices, but it's the projections and projection, it seems is such a important part of the, the alchemical process. And I would also imagine the imagination, the imaginal process as well, to become okay. aware of what actually we're doing as we're projecting ourselves out into the world. Well, yeah. And it, as long as we're operating unconsciously, then we just, the world is full of our projections, right? Right. These things that we're not seeing within ourselves that we project outward and in the form of other people and situations that we see as being external to us or repulsive or, mm -hmm. you know, annoying, yeah. whatever it is. Right. And the more that we can reclaim those aspects that we're projecting outward and recognize them within ourselves, the more conscious mm -hmm. we're becoming. And that's such yeah. a huge part of the work. Yeah. And yeah, there's different elements to this idea of projection. And that's one of yeah. them. That's a very psychological yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. And then there's this idea of like projecting ourselves through the imagination. And mm. that's going back to Neville Goddard and this new mm. thought idea of like manifesting through the imaginal realm. Mm. And that's really like the highest form of projection where we've cleared right. out all of these things that are working against us that are like pulling our energy down into the terrestrial realm. We've risen up and now we're, our lens is clear. And we can project a clear image of that which we desire to manifest right. into the imagination right, and right. feed that into the unconscious. But when we're not conscious of all these things within <laughs> us, we're doing that anyway. Right. We're constantly creating the world around us, co-creating. You know, it's yeah. not just us. It's a co-creation. And so there's a lot of influences at work. Mm -hmm. But when we're not conscious of it, then we're creating situations based on our fears and our anxieties and insecurities and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. And and this is something that the alchemists were doing as well, isn't it? That weren't they sort of projecting onto what they were doing in 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 their laboratories? Yeah, exactly. That's another way to think about it in the laboratory. That inner world is being projected outward, mm. but at the same time, it's being mirrored back. So there's right. this inner and outer relationship that's happening. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the inner world is being projected outward into the vessel. And right. so whatever's happening in the vessel, you know, to the ancient alchemists, that was not understood as being the unconscious that they were projecting in there. But right. when you read it, like you can, in terms of Jung and the way he looked at it. Right. I right. see that. Yeah. In the book, you mentioned a few times that you've got another book coming up. Yes. And my understanding is that the book is finished. Is that correct? Yes. I just completed the review of the copy edits. And so now okay. it's pretty much out of my hands and it'll go into the design phase and all of that. Okay. And it's supposed to come out July of 2023. Okay. The next year. Right. And that one is called The Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy. Okay. And that one goes even more, goes even deeper into this alchemical work. Okay. And yeah. Through the lens of art history and looking at some okay. pivotal art movements over the last couple of centuries and looking at the four stages of the alchemical great work or right. magnum opus. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you, I think, is because you do mention the great work, but this is also when you bring up the book and you're like, I'm going to go into more detail <laughs> in the next book. And you do kind of touch on it a little bit. And so I just thought maybe to the ending, the great work is that process of the philosopher's stone, discovering mm -hmm. the philosopher's stone, right? And there are the four stages the albedo, the citron, excuse me, excuse me, negredo, albedo, citronas, and rubedo. Yeah. Right. And so is it fair to say that this is a very shorthand way to describe these is a kind of death transformation and rebirth? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think that's a fair way to describe it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It all well, begins with that Saturnian root work and right. death and like looking at our shadow. And yeah, and that's the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then the albedo is a kind of purification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of cleansing purification phase or like dissolution into a world of symbolic meaning mm. and very watery, very dreamy. Okay. And the citrinitas, which is yellowing that's more of like a development phase or a maturation where things are mm. coming along like a baby in the womb or a flower mm. or you know ripening into a fruit and the rubedo would then be the birth or the rebirth of the mm. alchemist mm. and the final realization of the philosopher's stone within and that sort of gnosis or enlightenment mm. it's interesting that it's red the rubedo is red, right? Um, because I always associate red with blood and I guess I associate blood with pain, <laughs> but this would be a painful process, isn't it? It would be. And also red is associated with gold, interestingly. Mm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I think about the Phoenix rising from the ashes, you know, and the Phoenix mm. is often described as being a red and gold plumed bird. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. 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 Well, and something that came to mind and you know one of your interests uh, something that you've studied is shamanism is i find this also to be kind of shamanic in the sense that the sh shaman's initiation mm -hmm. often incorporates a kind of death mm -hmm. and a dismemberment mm -hmm. and a reconstitution and then rebirth and yeah. so I see that mirrored in this great work. Oh, definitely. And the whole underworld journey, you know, yeah. the going to the lower world that the shamans do or the other world and mm. that experience of dismemberment being torn apart or flayed. And you yeah. see that mirrored in different alchemical texts. And that's a big part of the alchemical work is this idea of separation. 
separating the subtle from the gross because in order to be reborn we have to first like understand what we are and so there's right. this sort of unraveling or coming apart that we have to go through right right yeah i've often wondered if alchemy is the sort of western version of shamanism yeah i think i think you could make that comparison yeah yeah because i always wondered i mean you know the shamanic seems to be pretty much everywhere Mm -hmm. but yet it often is like missing in the Western traditions. But yet when I look at alchemy and sort of the philosophy of hermeticism, I'm like, that seems so shamanic to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, in your new book and the title again is the hermetic marriage of art and alchemy, mm -hmm. is there going to be more of your artwork in there? Yes, there will be. Good. Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I did find the artwork quite stunning. I like oh, the artwork you. quite a bit. And so let me ask you, other than this book, the next book that's coming out and Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy, it's been released. Um, mm -hmm. So it's out in the world now. What's next for you? Mm. Well, right now, I'm sort of in this phase of just tending to my newborn baby, which is this book, okay. which is taking a lot of energy and time. And yeah. Once that calms down a little bit, I would really love to get back in the studio and get back to work there. But I am at the same time formulating ideas for the next book. Mm. And I don't want to say anything about that yet. Sure. And I'm also developing some coursework. And I'm hoping okay. to have that available next year. Uh, okay. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Curious. Have you ever, since you have an interest in Tarot and looking at your artwork, have you ever considered creating a, a sort of a, your own version of a hermetic Tarot deck? <laughs> I get that question a lot. Yeah. And in a way, I feel like each of my paintings is, is its own tarot card, you know, okay. but yeah. um, I have yet to embark on the great work of developing a tarot deck of my own because okay. it would take me a very long time with yeah. the rate that I paint out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of work. There's what, yeah. 78 cards. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? The best place to go is my website. And maybe you can have a link to that in the show notes, but it's I just so. my name, marlena7bremner.com. And I also post on Instagram and my handle there is at M, the number seven artist. And I have a Facebook as well. And that's just Marlena seven Bremner artist. And I also have a Patreon so people can subscribe and I have a blog on there that goes back for years and lots of writings about alchemy and hermeticism and my art. And so that's a really good way to go a little deeper and to see where I'm coming from and also to support the creation of new work. And I release new posts whenever I finish a new painting at a certain tier. And I also send out rewards at a higher tier. And so yeah. that's a great way to get involved and to stay in touch with me. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll put in links in the show notes in the video description. Okay. Um, so seven, it was wonderful speaking with you and I really did enjoy your book. Like I said, I've read a few books on hermetic philosophy and I think that you did an excellent job presenting it to people in a way that is accessible, well-written and engaging. So I highly recommend people if they have an interest in hermetic philosophy to pick up your book. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate that. And it was a pleasure to talk with you today, truly. All right. All right. Well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 59 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or watch this on Spotify. I'd like to remind everyone about the first Rebel Spirit Radio live stream, which is scheduled for Sunday, December 4th. Dr. Sharon Kogan will be returning to talk more about dreams and to interpret dreams for folks who join the live stream. Be sure to follow Rebel Spirit Radio on Facebook and or sign up for the newsletter at rebelspiritradio.com. That way you can be informed of the live stream with Sharon as well as all future live events. I'll also be launching a Patreon in December, but until then, you can still make a one-time donation via PayPal if you'd like to support my work here on Rebel Spirit Radio. The link is in the show notes or video description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. 
It only takes a second, and your five-star ratings really do help, especially if you listen on Apple. If you have a minute to spare, please consider posting a short but positive review. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed whenever I upload new content. Also, please feel free to share this uh, episode with friends, family members, or even co-workers that you think may be interested. That's one of the best ways to help me grow this audience. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. May you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.